Time, 9.30 p.m. This is News 5 Tonight with Suzanne Ho. Tonight, sports fans will have to pay almost double from next month to watch their favorite games on cable. A lead on the missing girl Wang Na, police say she was last seen with this man, a friend of her mother's. Tonight, some 200 people sign up for a massive search in a bid to find missing 8-year-old Huang Na. The man wanted in connection with Huang Na's disappearance. Tonight, police make a grisly discovery at Teluk Hill Park. They strongly believe they've found the body of... For an 8-year-old, Huang Na was unusually street smart independent and resourceful. Living with her mother at the Pasi Panjang Wholesale Centre, she usually spent her time wandering the centre on her own, chatting with the uncles and aunties and eating meals by herself. She also excelled in her studies and had aspirations to become a doctor. Huang Na was the daughter of Huang Shu Ying, a Chinese national who migrated to Singapore for better money for herself and a better education for Huang Na. However, she still had a family back in her hometown of Fuzing and often had to fly back to take care of them. Both mother and daughter lived in a shared flat where their bedroom was so tiny that it could only hold one person. Of course, such detailed information is readily available only because something terribly unspeakable happened to the two. On the unassuming day of October 10th, 2004, Xu Ying, the mother, had flown back to China to visit their family, leaving Huang Na in the care of one of the flatmates, Li Shi Ting. On that afternoon at 1pm, Huang Na went over to the market's phone booth and called her mother. They talked for about 6 minutes, in which Huang Na asked her mother to buy a computerized English dictionary and a pair of sandals. Once the phone call was concluding, Huang Na's mother told her to hurry up home, but she never returned home. Initially, Huang Na's caretaker was not worried in the slightest that the former did not return home immediately. After all, she was known to wander around the market by herself. Surely, this time would be no different, right? At 2.30pm, the caretaker sensed something was wrong and began to grow concerned. She began to look around for any signs of Huang Na, first around the market area and then around her school. Nothing. She returned back to the shared flat and enlisted the help of the other three flatmates and they spent the rest of the afternoon and evening searching for her. They also asked regulars at the market if they had seen Huang Na. Only a few had any information. One of them was a man called Tuk Leng Hao, a 22-year-old Malaysian vegetable packer who worked with Huang Na's mother. When interviewed by police, he recounted that he had encountered Huang Na immediately after her phone call with her mom. Tuk had told her to quote, go home. He even offered to show police the exact spot where he had last spoken to her. However, a few days later, Tuk changed his story. Instead of him telling Huang Na to go home, he saw Huang Na getting kidnapped by another trader at the center, that trader being someone who wanted to quote, teach Huang Na's mother a lesson. Tuk claimed he had connections that could potentially release Huang Na, however, the phone number that he needed to call to do so was at his flat. Police had also offered for him to do a lie detector test at the police HQ, which Tuk surprisingly agreed. Now, keep in mind, at this time, Tuk was cooperating with the police. Sure, he was a potential suspect, but the police did not treat him like a criminal, more like an eyewitness that could help with the case. Besides, according to the police themselves, there was not enough grounds to detain Tuk anyways. So, on the 20th of October 2004, Tuk, accompanied by four officers, went to his flat to search for the phone number that would free Huang Na. But, Tuk could not find it. Afterwards, Tuk and the other police officers were on their way to the police HQ when the former was to take his lie detector test. 
midway through the ride, Took said he wanted to stop to have a meal as he was hungry. So they stopped at the Tanjong Paga railway station to have a meal. Took excused himself to visit the toilet midway through his meal. Time passed as the police officers waited for Took to emerge from the restroom so they could continue on their journey. But what the officers did not know was that Took was already on his way to the Woodlands Malaysia checkpoint. He had somehow sneaked out of the railway station and hailed a taxi. When this was revealed to the public, the details were kept vague as how he escaped was honestly quite embarrassing. While on his way to the police station, Took was given a visitor's pass that bore the Criminal Investigation Division's emblem. At the checkpoint, he kept the pass on as he walked confidently across the checkpoint, calm and collected. People and security guards must have thought he was a fellow guard or officer as this ruse somehow worked and he was in Malaysia by the next day. Back in Singapore, Missing Huang Na became the talk of the town. Media outlets were reporting and updating about the case non-stop as the people of Singapore prayed for her safe return. Volunteers handed out leaflets of Huang Na's disappearance that included details of the clothes she was last seen, barefooted, wearing shorts, and a denim jacket. Newspaper interpreted this as people uncovering their quote, kampong spirit, where the community of Singapore truly felt like, well, a community, which, where each person kept one another. Taxis were advised to search for Huang Na as they went about their business, and the search even expanded up to Malaysia. After Tuk's escape, a nationwide manhunt started. This manhunt eventually expanded to Penang, Tuk's hometown. It was revealed that Tuk met up with some friends after he crossed the checkpoint. These friends helped Tuk to travel to Penang where he would stay until he voluntarily gave himself up to the Malaysian police on the 30th of October. After giving himself up, he conducted a pretty strange sort of press conference in which he told what uh, the press wanted to know to his friend, in which the friend would then tell the media what Took told him. So yeah, so through that, Took revealed a multitude of different stories and reasons why he gave himself up, including political issues like the potential deterioration of relationship between Malaysia and Singapore because of his escape. Uh, Took's lawyer, Subhas Anadan, would later state that he felt as if Took saw himself as a hero of some sort for surrendering to the police. Quote, he appeared the one to paint himself as the hero. I think by this point, some delusions of grandeur had set in. He was deluded in that he thought he could be a savior of two countries. That's why he eventually surrendered. End quote. After he was extradited back to Singapore, he revealed to the police his connection to Huang Na's disappearance. It was known that Huang Na was a regular playmate of Tuk's, despite their nearly two decade age difference. Huang Na and Tuk were known to be close, with the former referring to him as uncle. Tuk told police that he had not killed Huang Na. On the 10th of October 2004, he convinced Huang Na to play a game with him in the storeroom of the market. This game was a form of hide and seek. It involved Tuk tying Huang Na's ankles, legs, or arms while Tuk went to hide. This was a game that they apparently played often. After tying her up, Tuk left her alone so she could hide. But after Huang Na didn't respond, he went to check on her. Tuk found her lying on the floor, with him describing her to be in a quote spasm and blood dribbling from the corner of her mouth. Quote, her eyes were wide open and there was urine all over the floor. I immediately went over to call her name, but she did not reply, and she was still having a spasm. I did not know what to do. I wanted to untie her ankles, but I did not know how to undo the knots. I sat on the chair in the daze and looked at her. End quote. Took then, quote, chopped the back of her neck either to wake her up or put her out of her misery. The, the sources conflict on what his intent was when he was, chop, when he was chopping the back of her neck. But after that didn't work, 
Took told interrogators he was at a loss and his mind, quote, went blank. He then put both of his hands around Huang Na's neck and pressed it for reasons he states even he doesn't know. Huang Na started hiccuping and took decided to next stamp on her head three times. His next action, as if things couldn't get more bizarre, was to strip and molest her with his fingers to give off the impression that she had been raped, before stuffing the body into an empty cardboard box. He took a pair of scissors to cut her clothes in order to quote, make it real, and used nine layers of tape to seal the cardboard box before cycling to Telok Blanca Hill and throwing the box down the hill. To support Tuk's confession, the forensic team examined the room where this deadly game of hide-and-seek took place, and they found signs of a struggle. They also found adhesive tape, a pair of scissors, fiber, and a box cutter. Upon closer examination, the fiber was made out of denim, and if you remember, Huang Na was last seen wearing denim clothing. The tape that was found in the storeroom was an exact match to the shape of the last strip of tape used to seal the box. More importantly, it bore Tuk's fingerprints. Huang Na's DNA was also found in the room, in the form of blood stains on the carpet, a strand of hair, a child-sized fingerprint, and faint smears of blood on the walls. During Huang Na's autopsy, the doctor identified five injuries on the girl's face, all possibly regarded as consistent with the forcible covering of her mouth and nose with a hand, enough to cause death by obstructing the air passages. Huang Na's head also suffered injuries similar to something heavy hitting her head and bruises were also found on her tongue. The morning after the interview, police swarmed Telok Blanga Hill and eventually found it, a cardboard box originating from the Bukit Panjang Wholesale Centre. After the box was transported to the Singapore General Hospital, Huang Shu Ying positively ID'd the body from its front teeth. Huang Na was found. On the 11th of July 2005, the trial that would decide the fate of Tuk Leng Hao started. Tuk was represented by prominent lawyer Subhas Anandan, while the prosecution was led by Lawrence Ang. The prosecution's case was one of simple sexual assault and subsequent cover-up. The prosecution alleged that Tuk lured Huang Na into a storeroom using fruit, bounding her under the pretext of that game they played, sexually assaulted her and strangled her, kicking and stomping to ensure she was dead, and afterwards disposed of her body. The prosecution framed Tug as fully being in control of himself, having no mental illnesses whilst carrying out his crime. Based on the evidence, this definitely had some credibility. Though Tug had an IQ of 76, low enough to be considered mentally disabled, there were some instances where he showed his cunningness. For example, while disposing of Wang Na's clothes, he chose a rubbish bin that had no CCTV cameras and waited for night time to cycle to Telok Blanga Hill to get rid of the body. However, there was also evidence that did not entirely favour the prosecution. For starters, the cause of death could not exactly be pinned down. The doctor working on the autopsy states that the cause of death was airway occlusion. This could mean that took strangled Huang Na, or it could possibly mean that Huang Na choked on her own vomit and died, possibly from a seizure. Plus, the description that Tuk gave about how Huang Na had blood dribbling from her mouth and urinated all over the floor did match one of a seizure. The bruises on her tongue also could be explained by how biting down on her tongue while having the seizure. Plus, no semen was detected in Huang Na or in the room, casting doubt on the claims of sexual assault that the prosecution was presenting. The defense case consisted of causation how the girl died, which we went through earlier, and diminished responsibility. Subhas Anadan, in his book, The Best I Could, had this to say about Tuk. 
He described Took as somebody who, quote, wasn't playing with a full deck of cards, end quote. He compared his sickly smell to that of Anthony Lurs, another high-profile Singaporean convicted criminal. Whereas Anthony's smile was arrogant, Took wore a more sickly one. Anadan also stated that while interviewing Took, the latter would give irrelevant and random rants, which gave Anadan the impression that Took was mentally disabled, which he was. For example, after Took returned to Singapore and confessed his involvement, he changed his story. This time, he talked about hired killers from China who wanted to get revenge on Huang Na's mom because of something she did in China. Took claimed he was forced to murder Huang Na by these Chinese killers, despite the fact that the market's CCTV did not see any such foreign killers. When confronted with this fact, Took said that the killers were so good at their job that they could go invisible if they wanted to. Thus, Took listened to his lawyer's advice and chose to remain silent when asked to present and explain himself on the stand. This was to prevent the prosecution from poking holes into the defense's argument. Anadan argued that Took was suffering from schizophrenia, calling um uh uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to call him Dr. R. Uh, Dr. R, a physician in private practice to support this. In response, the prosecution called upon... Uh, uh, I'm just going to call him Dr. G, a psychiatrist at IMH, to rebut Dr. R. The prosecution's psychiatrist explains that if Took really was suffering from schizophrenia, it was important to analyse his conduct before during and after the murder. Dr. G would go on to say how he has never seen a case where a person would suddenly become mentally ill at the time of the offence. He would say that the patient would usually display signs of social and occupational dysfunction. Finally, he would ask how could a schizophrenic like Took be able to methodically and efficiently dispose of Huang Na's body, like avoiding the cameras and all that jazz. If things couldn't get worse for Took, it somehow got worse. Any uncertainty about Took's action on the 10th of October 2004 was quickly cleared up after a video was shown in court, in which Took reenacted what he did to Huang Na using a chow dummy. He was shot explaining how he packed the box and his violent actions, like stamping the dummy's neck and chopping its nape. Subhas Anadan was not pleased about this reenactment as it really damaged the defense, because it portrayed Took as a very aggressive and violent person. When asked why he even chose to participate in the video, Took said that his interrogators offered reduced charges if he did so. He also said that he was asked to do things for the recording, but couldn't remember if he actually did. However, these actions did match his initial statements to the police. That, along with the strong forensic evidence, let justice lie to find Took Leng Hao guilty of the murder of Huang Na and sentence him to death on the 26th of August 2005. Took proceeded to appeal his conviction but was denied. However, this denial was actually a rare split decision. See, how the Court of Appeal worked was that there would be three judges that reviewed the prosecution and defense's case one last time. The majority of the three would decide if the original conviction would be upheld or if a different sentence would be given. More often than not, all three judges would usually upheld the original conviction, but Took's trial saw a two to one split. The judge that was in favor of Took, Justice Kan Ting Chiu, disagreed that the prosecution had proven their case beyond reasonable doubt, choosing to believe that there was not enough conclusive evidence to prove the cause of death. Something that surprised me while researching for this case was the fact that 30,000 people actually signed a clemency petition for Took. And a clemency petition is basically uh, one, one of leniency and mercy for Took. And uh, this surprised Mr. Arnadan because Took had absolutely no sympathy when the case first started. He was basically condemned in Arnadan's word, especially when he escaped. And relating to this case, Mr. Anadan talks about how the media shouldn't have built Took up as 100% guilty. And in the late lawyer's memoirs, 
the chapter talking about Took's case was titled The Man Who Should Not Have Been Hanged. And finally, on the 23rd of October 2006, Took's plea for clemency failed and he was hanged by the neck until death on the 3rd of November 2006.